You are watching Chaos TV and we're starting off with the Cornwall Pride Show, which uh, ordinarily we have Pudge um, or uh, Nathan actually introducing us, um, but it's me. So great. Um, we've just come out of February and it's LGBTQ plus History Month. Um, and we've connected with Sophie Mayer from Queer Kerno, Mikey Stevens, the EDI lead from the Royal Cornwall Hospital, both connecting and supporting the community right here in Cornwall. And actually, um, I'm really, really excited. Um, I've called uh, them a superstars, but they don't know that um, because they have been sharing LGBTQ uh, sports news, information, wearing awareness for at least four years, locally, nationally and globally uh, and he also happens to be a local BBC Radio Cornwall presenter Jack Murley who produces um, and presents uh, the BBC LGBT sports podcast so thank you very much for joining us today oh thank you it's a pleasure what a list to join it's amazing thank you for having me here yeah no absolutely and actually um, last week we've been talking about um, the, the new formats that we have within the Cornwall Pride show and the first format that we have, or the first element we have, is our LGBTQ plus news. It's going to be a little bit different, though, because it's about sports. So actually, <laughs> really, I'm kind of going to be moving across to Jack for this. Um, and the first um, piece of news we have is uh, Sky Sports FA Cup news. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is my type of thing, right? This is, this is what I love, because I just cannot get enough of the romance of sport. And the FA Cup sums this up brilliantly even though my team Spurs were knocked out of the competition last night, which I didn't know when I'd sent it to you. <laughs> so, so for me, the FA Cup sums up everything great about sport, but it's also a really great opportunity for LGBTQ plus supporters groups to make themselves known in football, because what you often see before big FA Cup ties, before big games, is groups like the Proud Lily Whites for Spurs or Irons and Proud for West Ham really getting together and showing their pride and coming together. And for me, it's like my two favourite things. You've got football on the one hand, inspiring the LGBTQ plus community on the other, and they all come together in this celebration of football. It's brilliant. No, it's absolutely fantastic. I think we've got a link as well from Sky Sports just to, to highlight what's going on, including, I would imagine, um, Spurs being kicked out last yeah, night. Yeah, there we are. I can see the headline there. Conte can't tackle, uh, can't tackle the reality after Spurs dumped out of the FA Cup. But this is the, the glory of the FA Cup, right? It's Middlesbrough. Let, let's take my Spurs team so okay. we don't offend anyone else. <laughs> this is the glory of it because a team like Middlesbrough can be in the FA Cup and they may not be having the best league season but they can go on a journey and they can play a team like Spurs and they can have a victory that lasts forever. And it's great financially for these clubs as well, but it's just a great story. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Truro City went on a journey through the FA Cup as well. And I was fortunate enough to, to follow them on that journey where they went Fantastic. to play Charlton. Wow. And you're in London and you're sitting at the Valley Stadium and you're there and you're commentating and you can just hear these Truro City fans who followed the journey all the way up through following their team in the FA Cup. It's just fantastic. So when I knew we were going to be talking sport, we had to talk about the FA Cup. Sadly, it didn't go the way I wanted for my team, <laughs> but at least we had to mention it. Uh, well, talking about something else that, um, with sport being able to go to London and different areas of the country, Cornish Pirates. Yeah, yeah, so the Cornish Pirates, I mean, there's a little bit of a family story there for me because Dad actually played for the Cornish Pirates back when they were Penzance and Newlyn, so this is a long time ago. But the Cornish Pirates had a tremendous result in the RFU Championship this past Sunday against the Jersey Reds, who I used to commentate on when I worked in the Channel Islands. But it's all been in the news recently because promotion and relegation from the league the Cornish Pirates are in is very complicated. You would think... The best team goes up, yeah, the worst yeah, team yeah. goes down. That's that's the same in like football leagues. From it, mem yeah, no, exactly. You're, you're spot on. That, that's what... You're right. You don't need the, to... The vacant <laughs> face here is I have absolutely no idea about sports. So I'm no, just kind of going, yes. No, yes, you, you, yeah. no you're exactly right. And, and that's what you always learn about sport, right? Yeah. Is that the best teams go up, the worst teams go down, and that's why you play. We're seeing more of a move towards a more franchise model, which they have in the States, where you have the same teams in the same league all the time. And if you come bottom, you come bottom. It doesn't really matter. And interestingly for the league okay. the Cornish Pirates are in, there's just been a meeting in the past couple of days where actually the, the governing bodies have said the teams that have applied for promotion, and it wouldn't have been the Pirates this year because of their stadium, but the ones with the stadiums who wanted to go up have been told can't do it. Your stadiums aren't up to par, so you're not able to go up. Wow. So it's an interesting take on the fact that when we talk about sport and what makes it great, promotion and relegation, we're moving in some areas to a model where actually it's not quite as simple as that. 
Okay, um, so let's talk about Leicester Pride and Fox's Pride. So we'll just pop that up on the screen. Um, so Leicester and Fox's Pride do the double at Football versus Homophobia Awards. Yeah, so this is um, a brilliant set of awards won by the, the FVH group, Football versus Homophobia, which have been going for a fair old time now. And what they do is try and make football feel like somewhere where everyone's welcome. And often the LGBTQ plus community can feel like football isn't a place for them. And FVH run a month of action through February, so it's just come to an end. And part of that month of action is their big celebration, these awards, where they recognize people at different levels. Um, and they say, right, you're our voluntary group of the year. You're our advocate of the year. You're our team of the year. And Leicester City and, and Fox's Pride, who are their inclusive supporters group, were recognized and justly so for the work they do um, in football. Um, a guy called Rishi Madini uh, was one of the award winners and Leicester City really lent heavily into this throughout the month and it's great to see them recognised. Um, it's just great to see football really being at the forefront of this type of thing as well because often when we talk about football so much of the conversation is around when will a male player come out at the elite level in English football this stuff happening under the radar doesn't get as much attention. So to see Leicester, great club, great supports group recognised, it's what it's all about. Fantastic. Uh, and lastly, um, the P Winter Paralympics are happening right now? They're, they're getting underway very shortly. We okay. just had the Winter Olympics wrap up yep. and then they have a little break in the Winter Paralympics start, which I wanted to mention just because of the change we've seen in, in Paralympic sports since London 2012. And in the podcast I do, we've been fortunate enough to have on so many Paralympians. And they all say that London 2012 was the real spark that got the Paralympic movement going to where it is now. Now, I'd love to say the BBC deserves a load of credit for that. We did all right, but Channel 4 was a real mover and shaker behind this. Do you wow. remember those um, superhero campaigns? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So that was really the first time that Paralympic sport had been put front and centre on a major broadcaster and given wow. the platform it deserved. And from there, we had the same in Rio. We're having the same now with these Winter Games. It's fantastic. And I, I love it. I don't know about you. I know sport's not your major thing, but everyone has one thing they sort of watch and go, I'm hooked on this. I never saw this before the games, but now I'm into it. Curling. There we I go. I think it's just fantastic. <laughs> well, funnily enough, we had on the podcast we put out today, Bruce Mowat, the um, okay. Team GB skip who won silver at the Winter Olympics just gone a couple of weeks back. Wow. And he was on sharing his story. And I said to him, look, what's it like? Because for four years, no one knows your sport. Yeah. And then every four years, you're the guy, right? Yeah. Everyone gets involved. And he says, great, it's great. For two weeks, I go to people, I'm a professional curler. And they go, oh, wow. Yeah. Whereas for the other time, they just don't care at all. So the, the stones that they use, are they, they're from Scotland. Is yeah. That right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, don't push me too far on this <laughs> because I'm going to bluff it a little bit. But I, I think I was looking. I was if right. someone in Cornwall wanted to get into curling, where their nearest rink was, I think it's like Cambridge or okay. something like that. So okay. not near at all. Well, potentially the new um, ski slope in Cornwall might help. Might there might be a rink? <laughs> I don't there. think the incline would help. <laughs> no, maybe not. Um, so thank you very much for the news. Um, we've got uh, community songs um, each week as well, and a fabulous uh, performance from um, a regular at Cornwall Pride is Sammy Casey um, with Slide. I tried one too many times but I fell I left all my friends behind and I fell Then all these things they happen for a reason and all my friends, they understand my reasons When it's time to let go There's something you should know It's never easy
time to let go There's something you should know It's never easy Uh, that was Sam Casey with Let It Slide. And you know what, I just realised I completely muffed the, um, the intro around the format. So we just did the news, um, we're going to do our interview, and then at the end of the show we have queering. Um, thank you so much, Jack, for doing the news review. There we go, that's actually what it was called. <laughs> um, and linking it with sports and the community. And this is what you do. So, what do you do? Who are you? <laughs> That's a good way to start. So um, I am a presenter at Radio Cornwall, but alongside that I present the BBC's LGBT Sport Podcast, which is a weekly show that basically is for everyone, but the essence is all our guests happen to be either LGBTQ+, or they happen to be LGBTQ plus allies. And we get them on each week, doesn't matter where in sport you are, and we have a bit of a natter. It's a dream. I love it. It sounds incredible and it's kind of it's new to me so I've been, I've been listening and I'm kind of taking in lo loads of bits of information but actually it didn't start as the LGBT sports podcast it started as the other side what was the journey and, and of, as well it was on uh, BBC Radio Jersey yeah so my sort of potted history is I started doing radio in Cornwall doing sports commentaries which I love doing and then I worked at Radio Cornwall for a bit and then I wanted to spread my wings a bit so I went to Somerset and was presenting there and doing commentaries and then BBC Radio Jersey said do you fancy coming here and being our sport presenter so I was there doing the sports shows and I remember having a conversation with my mum when I was back visiting her and I said just ridiculous There's, I can't be the only gay person in sport there must be others and why don't we talk about it and she sort of looked at me and said, if only someone had a radio show, eh, where they could do it. <laughs> and she put me in my place and I thought, OK. So I, I said I pitched to my bosses, really. I said, I'd like to do just something every week where we get a different LGBTQ plus person in sport on. And that's what the other side was. There was a segment of interviews. And the reaction to it was such that we thought, well, hello, there might be a podcast here. And that's how it grew. So that was in 2018 we started that, never knowing we'd be here 227 episodes in and still going so that's sort of the potted history and your 250th episode is in, in a few weeks time it's gonna have to be yeah i mean because what we do is we tend to stack them up so yeah. we, we published our, our 227th but we've got a few in the back catalogue and so we know 
yeah, this summer probably episode 250, which is bonkers, but but pretty cool. It's absolutely amazing. And you mentioned this a couple of times. Um, you were a sports commentator as well. How's, yeah. How did that all start? It, do you know what? I don't think anyone wakes up and thinks, oh, I'm going to do that. Because no one tells you at school, do they? No one says, you want to be a commentator, here's what you need to do. I just was always able to talk and I went, did a degree in history and politics at uni, no broadcasting experience, and actually went to a community station, Radio St. Austell Bay, was presenting there, and saw a work experience place at Radio Cornwall to do sport for six weeks. And so I was very fortunate I got that opportunity. And at the end of that six weeks, they said, you've, you've not broken anything, you're not terrible, do you fancy going out on a Saturday for, you know, a couple of quid and doing some reports? And you just began to learn how to do it. And then they say, you can report. Do you fancy commentating? Which is terrifying because, you know, the first time they come to you and they say to talk you through the action, Jack Murley, and you realize, oh my goodness, I've got to talk this whole time. And you really learn by doing. And that's how it came about. And I just loved it. I just loved doing it. Um, has there only been any moments where you've um, messed up the names of oh, people? <laughs> I have there. I mean, look, the, the, <laughs> the thing is, not only do you mess up the names, sometimes the team sheets are given to you and the names are in the wrong place. Oh, no. The worst one I had, I was doing Yeovil Town Ladies against Liverpool Ladies in the Women's Super League. And there was something going on at pitch side, and I couldn't work out what it was. And someone comes up to me very sheepishly from Liverpool saying, Liverpool have forgotten their kit. So Liverpool will be playing in Yeovil's away kit which means none of the names and numbers on the back of the, the <laughs> Liverpool players match anything. And it was chaos. And I just remember thinking, if I can get through this, I can get through anything. But I would hate to listen to it back because it would have been very, very shaky as a commentary. Oh, no. Um, and kind of when, with that commentary and kind of thinking about your, your journey, really, as a journalist, what's been your journey over the last four years with the LGBT sports podcast? It's been a bit of a ride because podcasts aren't, without getting too technical, they're not like radio. You can drive along, hear someone on the radio, go back to it, you know, dip in and out. With podcasts, you have to commit to want to listen. So growing it has been a real challenge and also just convincing people that it's something you want to do. Because I don't know about for you growing up, but when I was growing up, you didn't hear LGBTQ plus people in sport sharing their stories. So when someone you've never heard of knocks on your door or drops you an email and says, do you want to come on to this thing I'm launching? You have to build trust. So really, the past four years have been about growing the pod to a place where people feel comfortable to come on and share their stories. And we've had moments along the way where you go, oh, OK, we're now at that next level up because Claire Balding's done it. So we can now say to our next person, oh, Claire Balding did it and she enjoyed it. So for the past four years, it's been just about growing it and getting the word out. But from where we started to where we are now and yeah. where sport is now, it, it's night and day. Well, and kind of those connections and we'll come on to what it means for um, the communities to have the, the podcast and access sports. Um, a little bit more about you. You are a huge MMA and wrestling fan. Yes. Is that right? <laughs> um, so what is it like talking about these great sports and connect, connecting communities to those sports? Yeah, I mean, MMA, I, I love to watch. I've sort of got away from it a little bit, but it, it's great to connect people to it. We've had MMA fighters like Molly McCann on the podcast, and, and that's great because you're like, oh, I know you, I've watched you. You're someone I really look up to. Pro wrestling, people don't get as much because it's entertainment, isn't yeah. it? Yes, it's sport, but it's entertainment. But the trouble is, if we have an LGBTQ plus wrestler on, like, like we have and Brad Slayer, for example, from Norwich, who's a big wrestling star, or some of the Americans on... I have to stop myself because I want to go, yeah, but tell me about that match in the sixth minute where you did that one thing. And, and you have to sort of go, no, oh my goodness. the general listener doesn't care as much as I do about this. But it's a treat. It's like it's it's such good fun. Uh, one of our other presenters, Pudge, uh, will be gutted that they're not here because he absolutely adores wrestling. It's so good. It's so good wrestling. But you will not convince someone who doesn't like wrestling to love it. It's, it's like you either get it or you don't. And yeah. if you don't get it, I can't, I can't convince you. But yeah, those are, those are the best conversations. They're great. Fantastic. OK, let, let's get into the nooks and crannies of this. Um, what's the point? Many people are going to ask this. What's the point of a dedicated LGBT sports podcast? Yeah, we, we get that a lot. And some people ask it really genuinely because they're the type of folks who, who really 
treat everyone the same. They yeah. they genuinely don't care if you're LGBTQ+, plus because you're the same person. And then we get the ones who say it in sort of a bit of a put down way. No one cares, don't talk about it. For me, the first is visibility. When I was growing up, the idea that you could be gay and love sport was not something you ever heard about. And our experience doing the podcast is I'm not the only one who heard that message. So the first point is, it's telling people they're not two separate things. You yeah. can be an Olympic gold medalist and a gay man, or you can carry the flag at a closing ceremony and be a gay woman. So that's point one. The second is, why not talk about it? Yeah. You know, sport, sports people are such global icons. Why not give them a platform to talk about their journey and the story they had? And also, for people in sport, when, when first and last are dictated by that much, you know, that much, if you're hiding your identity, I certainly know, it's exhausting, yeah. right? You, you spend so much time thinking about, am I gonna give myself away? Can I be myself? Now imagine you're an athlete and you're having those thoughts. That can be the difference between being an Olympian or not, winning a World Cup or not. So having people who are free to speak about themselves and say, look, being authentically me actually makes me a better athlete, it's priceless. And it's priceless for, for people of all ages who are LGBTQ plus and don't see themselves represented. And the thing we always say is, you don't have to be to, from the community to listen. We have loads of allies listen. So if you want to know what an Olympian nicks from the Olympic Village, we've got people telling you. You know, we've got all those <laughs> stories as well. I love that. And um, what do they nick? Do they? <laughs> Oh my God, how do you fit a duvet do they okay do these are duvets are very popular <laughs> badges um that type of thing yeah in fact we interviewed a badminton player recently and she she was on the sofa and she said I said what did you nick and she said this and she pulled it out and put it there so yeah stuff gets taken fantastic and um, there's lots of LGBT sport superstars and 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 um, sports stars um hopefully there'll be more as well which is going to be incredible um who's your favorite? I know, tough question. Uh, do you know well, what? Favourite to interview. Uh, Favourite to interview. That's really... Claire Balding was great because she was just... She gave us that visibility. She gave us the ability to get more folks on. Um, you sometimes pinch yourself. We did Helen and Kate Richardson Walsh recently, who I remember sitting very early in a studio watching win gold at Rio in the hockey in the Olympics. They were absolutely amazing. And then you get the stories that you don't you don't ever hear about till someone sort of drops you a message and says, do you, do you fancy coming and telling our story? There's a group called um, Queer Surf Club who are brilliant and they dropped me a message and I went over to St Agnes to record with them. And they're not the biggest guests we've had on, but yeah. the passion that came through and those stories of, of you know, Fraser from that club who, who had to pretend to be straight to learn to surf because he was in a country where homosexuality was legal. You think, blimey, I'd never have known that story if I didn't do this pod. And so... You know, ask me any day, I'll pick a different favourite. Yeah. I, I guess that's the joy of it, right? It, it's like a candy shop. You can just chat to people. Do you know, Queer Surf Club is phenomenal. Aren't I've, they? I've, yeah, so I've, I've been, I've connected with them as well. And they're, they're, the community that they've created within Cornwall and different, different areas of the UK is just amazing. And what's really interesting from them is, is they challenge perceptions. Because, you know, I said to, to Fraser, I'm sure you've had this conversation, well, surf in such a laid back chilled place surely there are no issues here and he goes yeah but think about it more think who's represented who isn't who's in the campaigns for ads who's getting the sponsorship and i love interviews like that when people yeah. will make me challenge my own thinking um what's been your favorite moment on the podcast i was really proud to be on football focus the other day which sounds really egotistical but we had a guy called james adcock on who's a football league referee and he shared his story for the first time with us. And that's always a big moment when someone is out to their friends and family, but not out to the wider world. And he came on the pod in, I think, October, National Coming Out Day, yeah. whenever that was, yeah. he, he came on. And Football Focus, the big TV show, said to me, can we have his contact details? Would you like to do a story with him? And so we got to do the story with him on BBC One, prime time, show I used to watch as a kid and I remember yeah. sitting and thinking, here I am, this gay guy from Cornwall who didn't think he could be himself in football, and that, that's me on the telly there. So that was a really proud moment. It sounds really egotistical, no, no, no. But, but it was. That was a moment where I thought, blimey, I've done that. But I think from a younger person, e e even today, and connecting with um, the communities, having those conversations about sports, having um, the, the ability of being able to be yourself and your authentic self, to 
be able to, for me, if I saw you there, I'd have been like, actually, I can continue playing football. My, my story was I, I used to play for, for Newquay Hornets as, as rugby and, and kind of played uh, football as well. Um, normally, I'd just get given the ball and I'd run in anything because I was fairly fast. Um, but when I came out when I was 14, I completely stopped playing. Yeah, and so many people have that, have that narrative. And, and, you know, the ones who do continue, they either will, you know, not be their authentic self for a long time, or they'll come out after they've left the game, or they'll go to inclusive clubs, which are great, but maybe doesn't let them fulfill the talent that, that they had to the level it should have been. And this is why I think the whole conversation about, we talk a lot, when will an elite level male player come out in the English game? And it seems to be a binary, almost like you do that and everything's fine. Whereas actually, what, what's 14 year old you and 14 year old me hearing when we go along to sports clubs? Is it an inclusive environment? If they see, you know, something we've done or something someone else has done and they go to their club, is the experience of seeing that visibility with what we do matched at the ground level? And that's a bigger conversation, but it's, it's one that needs to be had. And from that, there are lots of now LGBT sports clubs up and down the country um, and also internationally. Um, I believe there's even a gay games. Oh, the gay games are fantastic. Yeah, the gay games are, well, they wanted to call them the Gay Olympics. And this was in the 80s and the Gay Olympics, the Olympics said, mm, can't have the name the Olympics. And they were literally scratching Gay Olympics off the medals and calling it gay games. And it was started in San Francisco. And it was just from this guy who just used to really love multidiscipline sports. And then there was a Gay Games 2, and then a Gay Games 3, and now they are huge. People wow. bid for them around the world. There was one in Paris. Um, I don't think, don't quote me on this, we've had the most recent Gay Games because of the pandemic. Yeah. London bid for the Gay Games, and they are multi-sport disciplined events where LGBTQ plus people can come and compete in whatever sport they love, and they're just brilliant they're such good fun and and for folks who say well why do you need that if you've got the olympics it's not an either it's not an either or question there may be because the gay games are for anyone at any level yeah you can be rubbish and go to the gay games play a game of badminton walk in the opening ceremony it's a different way to get folks who may have been marginalized into sport and i think they're fab this it is it is really important and i think you just you, you just answered my next question in a way um why is it important to have these sports clubs well i think there's there's a couple of ways to look at it the first is that some people will say um well it, it, if you're out it, why do you need to go to a sports club that's for the lgbtq plus community actually many people who go to these clubs aren't out so that might be their only place in the week where they are able to go and be their authentic self to play sport. They may not be out at work, they may not be out at home, they may have that horrible feeling of having to watch everything they say apart from that one sports club where they can be themselves. So that's really important. The second is you, you get sports clubs spring up in all sorts of places around all sorts of communities. How many rugby clubs are around fishing villages or mining communities? Yeah why not around the LGBTQ plus community? And the other thing that's really important is they're inclusive. So they're, you'd be amazed how many straight cisgendered folks play for, quote, LGBTQ clubs, because they're, they're a place where, where everyone is made to feel welcome. And if, if you are someone who spends a lot of your time worrying about what you're saying, you're not confident in your sexuality, you're not confident in your gender identity, these clubs can really be a way to make you access that whole part of you. I just think from well, what you're describing, it's, it enables people. It, it enables people to feel confident um, in who they are and, and potentially those people that um, aren't out in those um, situations will start to feel confidence within that community and, and start to be able to be their authentic self. It's, yeah, it's so valuable. Absolutely. And look, I, 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 not because there aren't any inclusive clubs down here to do what I want to do, yeah. but if I go and play badminton at a new club, I know there'll be a question coming of, so do you have a girlfriend? And mm -hmm. then you have that choice. Now the cat's out the bag on me. Like I can't really, there's not much really a closet I can go back into. But you do have that thought of, yeah. well, do I, do I say I've got a boyfriend? Do I sort of tone it down and say partner? Do I laugh it off? Those are all things you have to consider. If you're at an inclusive club, you know that the answer you give to that question isn't gonna define the way you were seen at that club. You are not the gay player, yeah. you are just a player there. And look, they're not for everyone. Plenty of LGBTQ plus folks play at clubs that aren't of that model. 
but plenty do. There's room for both in the world, surely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's two uh, rugby clubs fairly close to Cornwall. You've got uh, West Country Wasps, which have been around for, I think, about four years mm -hmm. now. Um, and a new club, uh, I think it's the Plymouth Dolphins. Yeah, I th a very new. I, th I think, yeah. really, only the tail end of last year's start of this year they've sprung up, which is great. Yeah. Because what, what will happen as well is they'll get pulled into that community because they will go and have friendly, say, in Exeter, or they'll go yeah. and play Cardiff, or they'll go up to London, or they'll hear about something like the Bingham Cup, which is a great inclusive tournament, mm -hmm. which is a really powerful story for folks who don't know it. On, and, and I don't want to get too deep on this, but on 9-11, one of the folks on the plane that crashed in Pittsburgh that didn't reach its destination when the passengers took over the plane was a guy called Mark Bingham, who was a gay rugby player. And what they wanted to do in Mark's family to honor Mark was to have a rugby tournament in his mm -hmm. honor. That became the Bingham Cup. It's been going for 20 years this year, and it is the world's biggest rugby tournament where all the people who take part are from inclusive clubs, and it goes around the world. And so people may hear the story of the Bingham Cup from other club members mm -hmm. and bring it back to Plymouth and, and to the West Country Wasps and everything. So, And you're going to see more of these clubs springing up. I'm amazed there's not one in Cornwall yet. All the money in my pocket says if we do this again in a few years time there will be yeah that would be incredible have we seen what's the benefit to the communities um by having these lgbt sports clubs in and around them i think that look there's loads of that firstly for the people getting involved never hurts to get a bit of a sweat on never hurts to go and find a sport you love and that social aspect of things is great i think you see inclusive clubs partner up with different parts of the community as well you know they'll be getting involved in pride they'll be putting on taster sessions, they'll be getting involved with maybe national governing bodies. For example, up in Scotland, there's a club called Aberdeen Texali. I couldn't spell it for you, T-A-E-X-A-L-I, I am not think it's Texali. And what they do is they partner up with the Scottish RFU and they say to the Scottish RFU, how are you with your inclusion? What are you comfortable with? What, what maybe are you less comfortable with in terms of terminology? And sometimes it's an educating role because folks in governing bodies may be afraid to ask. Yeah. They may just say, I don't, I don't quite know where I am with this. Is there someone I can turn to with expertise? So it's an educating role as well. I mean, there is nothing bad, in my opinion, by having more sports clubs where everyone feels welcome. And yeah, absolutely. Kind of, it's, it's, it sounds like from the experience of these sports clubs that are in and around um, the UK, um, that it really does, it drives a benefit for the communities and creates these safe spaces? Yeah, absolutely. Completely a place of safe spaces, completely a place where the community can come and enjoy themselves and enjoy sports, and particularly in a team environment. One thing that, that someone said to me a while back on the podcast that stuck with me is actually sometimes when LGBTQ plus people come back to sport, they're coming back to individual sports. Um, they'll run a lot, they'll swim a lot in the pool, maybe they'll go cycling because they've had bad experiences in team environments. And actually what these clubs do is say, yeah, but you don't, you're not gonna get that experience at this place and it will draw that talent back in as well. So there are so many benefits. We've just come out of LGBT History Month in February. Um, separate to sport in a way, why do you think it's important to talk about um, LGBT history? Well, I think it's important to talk about all history, which isn't, you know, I'm not, not dodging the answer, but I think you need to talk about all history because we're yeah. part of a rich, broad, varied country. It's great to talk about all aspects of it. We can't ignore the fact that for a long time, LGBTQ plus history was not allowed to be taught about in schools. When I was growing up, Section 28 was in place. I didn't learn about LGBTQ plus history because it was legally prohibited. I couldn't. So I think you're playing catch up a lot in a lot of ways like that. But why wouldn't you want to know amazing stories? Why wouldn't you want to know about the Bingham Cup, about the gay games, about you know, some of the stories unrelated to sport? And I think by having a month, what you do is you concentrate the minds of a lot of folk. Yeah. So you know, Gloucestershire Cricket Club, for example, just put out a story with their physio who happens to be gay, sharing his story. We mm -hmm. see a lot of football clubs getting involved. Arsenal gave over their um, Twitter feed to the Gay Gooners fans. And I think what, LGBTQ plus History Month does is put an event in the diary that those big organizations can plan around and say, right, we want to be involved. Here's our month to do it. How can we be the most impactful with it? Now you should do it in other ways as well, but I think having a month just focuses a mind in quite an important way. Thank you for that. Um, so we've, we've kind of spoke about this already, kind of. Let's talk football. Okay. Okay, um, that, that, is the que that is the question mm -hmm. um, that a lot of people kind of gone, Oh, within the LGBT 
LGBTQ uh, plus community, there's no gay man within uh, the uh, English leagues. Um, what's the stigma? What's going on? So this is one where nuance really helps. Okay, so I think the first thing says, as you have, men and women, the two games need to be separated out. And I think you can look and you can say at the non-league level, there are lots of out folks who are yeah. absolutely thriving and folks who've stepped away from the game as well. And without totting it up, I would suspect the most guests we've had on the podcast since we've been going have been from football. There are gay commentators, referees, former chairmen, club photographers, reporters, journalists. So football is a lot gayer than you might think. Yeah. It doesn't always get that attention. Yeah. The other thing is, name me a gay premiership rugby player. Well, you can't because there aren't any. Name me a gay cricketer playing in the English county games. There's one, Steve Davis. I say one, I'm talking about being out. So often because there's so much focus on, on football because of its sport and its national significance, other sports where there's also that sort of lack of visibility don't get picked up on. Now, to come back to the question, what's the stigma? I think a lot of it is looking at the, the, the point where people come into football. So say I leave this studio and a footballer has come out in the time we've been on air, which could happen. It's what happened with Josh Cavallo. It just, out of nowhere, there he was and he shared his story. And say someone sees that footballer's story and they go along to their local club. Are they going to hear homophobic comments? Are they going to hear language that makes them feel welcome? What are they going to get from the terraces? What are they seeing their role models in the game already model with their behaviour? None of that gets changed with a player coming out. But perhaps one of the reasons we haven't seen that happen is because that stuff hasn't been addressed yet. And when you're being spotted for foot, I mean, to be a Premier League footballer, you've been signed up to academies at 12, 13, 14. We've had folks on the pod who've been offered the chance to have professional contracts who've walked away from the game because the environment hasn't been right. So Thomas Beatty wow. was signed up for Hull Academy. He could have been that player that everyone talks about because he would have gone on to play for Hull but there was something not right that made him walk away in the environment, not specifically at Hull, in football as a whole. Goodness. We've had a guy called Jake Williamson who could have played professionally up in Scotland. He would have been an elite gay man playing in, in football in Britain. He walked away because it wasn't quite right. So I think the potential to have had that person has been there already. Yeah. The game just needs to evolve where it is. And the response to Josh Cavallo when he came out Every club, every player showing support shows the progress we've made. Yeah. And I don't think we're too far away from it. I think the conversation needs to be, when that happens, and it will, is that the end of the conversation? Now, on the parallel level, it's a very different world for women's football. It is. But one thing I'm always conscious of is that the women's game took a long time to get there. Yeah. And I'm maybe not as qualified to speak on this as some of the guests we've had. but. We mentioned football versus homophobia. Lou Englefield is a fantastic woman in that field who does a lot of work. And one thing she speaks very eloquently about is, yes, we're there now, but don't forget the journey we've been on. There was a point where women playing football had, well, they're all gay, thrown at them as a way to demean them. Right. So now we're at a point where, yes, it's more inclusive. Yes, it's more welcoming, but they had to fight to get to that point. And as the game on the women's side of things get better, gets bigger, excuse me, there's, you're seeing some, not a lot, a tiny minority, but some homophobic language making its way into the game. So it's almost like men's football is sort of doing this and women's football is just a little bit doing that towards, you know, you're seeing incidents in women's football you'd never have dreamed of yeah. a few years back. So they're, they're on different paths and different journeys and, and comparing them is, is almost a little bit apples and oranges, but there are differences, as you say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for anyone, um, watching um, this with um, like a lens on um, the LGBTQ plus community and also thinking about the LGBTQ plus uh, people uh, and communities going into sports. The comment time and time again comes out, no one cares if you're gay. What would you say to those people? I think it's not true. I mean, flat answer, quick answer is it's not true. Plenty of people care if you're gay. If you're a 14 year old, who's struggling with your identity because you love football and don't see anyone like you, you see someone who comes out, that 14 year old cares if they're gay. The people in the club will care if you're gay because they want you to be your best authentic self. And if you're having to hide your identity, they care about that. They 
put it brutally, you're an investment for them. They want their investment to deliver to the best ability they can. Supporters will care. Now, not everyone will care to the same degree as that 14-year-old or the club or, or the player's family or whatever it may be, but so many people care, not in a, it's the most interesting thing about you, but because it's part of you. Why should you hide that away? Why should you, why should folk assume you're straight in sport unless you say, actually, I'm not straight, and then by simply saying I'm not straight, people go, no one cares. Do you see, do you see it's like a yeah. double-edged sword. Yeah. You have to conform to this straight stereotype, and if you're not straight and you say, hey, by the way, I happen to be gay, then you'll shut down as if you're trying to draw attention to something. And actually what folks who share their story are doing is actually saying, hey, look, I'm great at sport, but I'm also this as well, and both things are fine. So I think when people say no one cares, that means they don't care. And that's what we see a lot on social media. What they mean is, I don't care, stop talking about it, I don't want to know. Without blowing our own trumpet, the success we've had on the podcast probably shows more people care than you would think. Amazing. Thank you so, so much um, for sharing everything that you're doing and, uh, and the, the, the conversations that you're having. I think one of the, the podcasts I was listening to and talking about No One Cares is really the, the support that it gives to people. Uh, mental health within the LGBTQ plus community is dire and especially within uh, younger communities. And to have something to aspire to, to, to link to, to connect to, um, is so so important and ultimately saves people's lives one thing you said what's my favorite episode or favorite guest one moment that sticks with me is we went to a school up in devon where there were two swim teachers both at an elite level happened to both be lgbtq plus and one thing they said is we now give your pod to folks who come to us and say they're questioning their identity and they don't feel sure of themselves that is worth more than any award listener number for me, that's what it's about, that someone can listen and feel more comfortable in themselves. Job done. Thank you so, so much, Jack. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, we're going to go to a community performance and we'll be back with queering. Uh, we've got Benji Matthews with Daydream.
Uh, that was Benji Matthews with Daydream. You are back on the Cornwall Pride show on Chaos TV. Uh, we've just had an incredible interview with uh, Jack Murley. And now here's our segment, Queering. Guest, you have been prepped, but you don't know the questions. Uh, we've roughly 30 quickfire questions on everything about you. Okay. Okay, what do you do for work? Radio presenter. Your favorite place in the world? Cornwall. Uh, where in the world is your, your bucket list? Uh, South America. Uh, what's your favourite food? Pasty. Um, North Cornwall or South Cornwall? Sorry, South Cornwall. <laughs> Are you a beach person? Uh, no. Oh, I was going to say, what's your favourite beach? Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I love Charlestown. Charlestown is great. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, what's your, what activity is on the top of your bucket list? Uh, I want to go to a WrestleMania. Uh, well, what's your favourite <laughs> sport? Pro wrestling. <laughs> Sorry. And what sports do you do? Uh, badminton, five-a-side football, swim. Um, what's the most amazing person in the world? Uh, who? Oh, who's the most amazing person in the world? Do you know what? I'm watching a lot of Dragon's Den at the moment. I'm going to say Deborah Meaden. I'm a oh. little bit in love with Deborah Meaden at the moment. Uh, what other career would you do other than what you're doing now? Uh, professional wrestling commentator. Can, does that count? Is that close <laughs> no. enough? Oh, okay. I, okay. I would love to be an author in a little cottage and write books. Oh, why that career? because I think there's something amazing about getting to the end of having written something and going, right, that's done. Let's see what people make of it. There are other LGBTQ plus sports people. What's your top favorite? Uh, ooh, Billie Jean King is great. Top sports person ever. Muhammad Ali. Dog or cat? Dog. Early riser or night owl? Early riser. What's your favorite genre of music? Uh, oh, I'm rubbish at music. Can I say musicals? I like the musical. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I mean, I'm in the right place, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Uh, so a uh, top musician. Within uh, musicals. Oh, blimey. Oh, see, this or is... musical, favourite musical. Oh, favourite musical, Hairspray. Favourite track from Hairspray. You Can't Stop the Beat. Uh -huh. Or Good Morning Baltimore. Uh, tea or coffee? Tea. Uh, your worst subject at school? Maths. Do you eat or drink out? Uh, I eat out. What's your favourite restaurant or pub? Uh, ooh, uh, do you know what? Oh, it used to be the one I can't, can't remember what it's called now. That one in Truro. The Hubbox. Hubbox. Uh, your favourite sports team of all time? Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> Tell us about the funniest thing that's ever happened to you at work. Uh, I once fell in a hole getting out of a van um, doing a commentary because we thought we'd left a coat somewhere and we were leaving a very dark football ground and my co-commentator Dick said, just get out see if you've got the coat. I opened the door, he didn't know he'd passed by a ditch, went out, dropped about six foot into this ditch. He did not know where I'd gone. I couldn't explain so I was laughing too much. Were you okay? Yeah, we still call it the Bromley Hole incident. It's still, oh yeah. Um, which sports star do you want to interview that you haven't yet? Billie Jean King. Okay. Uh, what's your biggest phobia? Oh, do you know what? Sharks, but I think that's legit. Yeah, oh, okay. I think I'm allowed to be afraid of sharks. Yeah, yeah. Depends on what shark. Uh, what's your favourite subject in school? Uh, history. Uh, favourite person you'd like to take on a night out? Um, oh, Graham Norton. Fabulous. Uh, what three things would you take on a submarine? Book. Thermos of uh, tea and uh, probably a submarine instruction manual to get myself off it because I'm not surviving <laughs> down there. Um, your favourite human of all time? Uh, my favourite human of all time. Oh, that's really tough. I want to say my family, but I'm going to say Jim Ross, a professional wrestling commentator. <laughs> I can you tell I'm obsessed with wrestling. Uh, summer or winter? Summer. Uh, would you rather snuggle a starfish, a diplodocus, or a python? Python would kill me. Diplodocus is, uh, would probably thumb me to death, so it's got to be a starfish. Uh, what thing would you have in your fridge, or what thing do you have in your fridge all the time? Right, this is weird. I put bread in the fridge because I'm told it keeps it fresher for longer, and I said it to the person who I thought told me that, and they were like, no, you haven't got that from me, so bread goes in the fridge. Sorry. Love that. Uh, and your next LGBT event, what do you want it to be? Uh, I would love to do a big live show for the 250th episode. Oh, that's what I'd like to do. That sounds incredible. Um, that's it. Um, thank you very, very much. Are you, are you all right? I'm good, yeah. yeah. I thought it'd be worse than that. That was, that was quite nice, wasn't it? That's it for this week. A huge thank you to Jack. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks' time with the Cornwall Pride Show.